Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Kaufman, a retired family doctor and a CLL patient myself for 17 years and the co-founder, executive vice president and chief medical officer of the nonprofit CLL Society here at ASH 2022 in New Orleans. Dr. Brown? I'm Dr. Jennifer Brown. I'm director of the CLL Center and Institute Physician at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and the Worthington and Margaret Collette Professor of Medicine in the field of hematologic oncology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Brown, you've done some groundbreaking research in CLL and one of the most anticipated oral presentations at ASH is a paper that you're presenting on Xanabrutinib. I'm going to read the title of it and then I'm going to ask you to help us understand it and explain it. Xanabrutinib demonstrates superior progression-free survival, or PFS, compared with ibrutinib for relapsed refractory CLL SLL. Results from the first analysis of the Alpine randomized phase three study. So tell us why this study is important. What was the what were you trying to get? What questions were you trying to answer with this study? Right. Well, xanabrutinib, as you know, is a next generation BTK inhibitor, a covalent one. So in the same general class of drugs as abrutinib, but it's more specific for BTK than abrutinib. And it's also designed to maintain drug levels in the body continuously, whereas abrutinib drug levels drop, as do acalabrutinib levels. They, they can drop because the drugs work irreversibly. Xanabrutinib works irreversibly too, uh, but still maintains drug levels. So that's sort of a distinction that xanabrutinib has compared to the others. And so we did the study because we wanted to find out if this newer BTK inhibitor was in fact more effective than abrutinib the first in class drug. And we know that abrutinib has been extraordinarily effective and has had uh, changed the whole way we treat CLL, but we also know that it's had a significant adverse event profile. So we've seen studies that have compared ibrutinib to other first generation BTK inhibitors, which showed that they were equally effective, but had more adverse events. But this is different, right? Right, this is different. This actually shows that xanabrutinib is more effective at keeping people progression free than abrutinib. And it is also safer. <laughs> so who did you study in these? These were relapsed refractory patients. Give us a sense of the patients and the number of people that you were looking at in this study. Yeah, uh, there were about 650 patients enrolled. Big study, yeah. Yes, equally on the two arms. It was open to any relapsed refractory patient, but it ended up being patients with a median of one prior therapy. They could not have had a BTK inhibitor before, so most of them had had chemoimmunotherapy before. The median age was 67, 68 on the two arms, so relatively typical, a little bit young, but not as young as some studies. <laughs> right. And about 23% had 17P deletion or P53 aberrancy. All right. So not an atypical group uh, to be treating. And uh, the first issue is the safety issue. So when you're looking at, you know, xanabrutinib is still not approved in CLL, although it is improved in other things. Did you see any safety signals that were a concern? And how did that compare to a, uh, ibrutinib in terms of the adverse events? Right. There were no safety signals that were a concern. In fact, there were fewer serious adverse events, fewer events leading to discontinuation of treatment, fewer events leading to interruption of treatment. You know, the most common adverse events were, you know, low normal white blood cell counts and COVID-19, which those were pretty even in the arms. The, the most notable thing really was that the cardiac safety was much better with xanabrutinib. There was fewer adverse events, fewer serious adverse events, less atrial fibrillation. Only 5% of people had atrial fibrillation on xanabrutinib versus 13% with abrutinib. There were fewer cardiac events leading to drug discontinuation. Only one with xanabrutinib versus 14 with abrutinib. And you know, most notably, there were no cardiac deaths with xanabrutinib, whereas there were six with abrutinib, which was 1.9% actually. Well, that, is that Typical or is that atypical? That seems high to me, but is that? It's a little high, but GLOW was 3.4%. You know, it depends on the age of the patients, their comorbidities and whatnot. If you look at the entire trial experience with abrutinib, it's about 1%. Wow, and GLOW was another trial that used ibrutinib in one of its arms, so that's um, 
So that's a real significant issue for patients to consider. Were there any, we know with like a calibrutinib there's more headaches, were there any other issues, bleeding issues or anything with xanabrutinib that was different than with ibrutinib? No, not really. Uh, bleeding wasn't one of the major observations. There was one serious bleed with Xanu versus three with ibrutinib. Uh, neutropenia, uh, sorry, the low normal white blood counts was very slightly higher with Xanu, but there were fewer associated infections. So, you know, overall, I don't really think it was worse. It was really pretty similar. One so, thing that uh, has been interesting is that the rate of high blood pressure was pretty similar. Okay. And, you know, this is of interest because a calibrutinib, for example, the rate of high blood pressure is lower than with a brutinib. And xanabrutinib showed lower rates of hi new high blood pressure in the study in a different kind of disease called Waldenstrom's. So Alpine's a little bit of an outlier compared to the other xanabrutinib studies in looking the same as a brutinib with respect to high blood pressure. So we don't really know why that is or what will happen with longer follow-up. But most of the xanabrutinib experience has suggested that it should be a little bit better on high, on high blood pressure than a brutinib. Well, I think the really exciting part of this paper is what's in this title, demonstrates superior progression-free survival compared to ibrutinib. So uh, can you fill in the details on that? That's certainly groundbreaking news. Right. That, that's what's really exciting, because I'm not sure people expected that there would be an improvement in efficacy with drugs in the same class, right? So if we look at the two, the follow-up of the overall study is 30 months. So we have what we call a two-year landmark. That's where we estimate how many people are free of progression. And so that's 79% with xanabrutinib versus 67% with abrutinib. So 12%, you know, more than 10%, that's really quite a significant difference. And then the thing that really struck me is that even in the higher risk patients with 17P deletion, it's pretty much the same. It's 77% for xanabrutinib with 17P deletion, but abrutinib is worse at 55%. So wow. it's actually a 22% difference favoring xanabrutinib in the high risk patients. And we know that generally BTK inhibitors don't work as well in relapsed refractory patients, especially the high risk relapsed refractory patients. So having that mid 70s, high 70 response rate in that difficult to treat population is, is The response rate is actually higher. The response rate with Xanu is like 86%. This is oh, the two year progression oh, wow, free survival. That, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Thanks for that correction. Yeah. So help me understand because I, I, I want to push you on this a little bit. We know that if a drug is better tolerated, people tend to stay on it. So are we seeing better results because people aren't stopping their XANU and that's why we're seeing better progression-free survival? Or are we seeing that that really doesn't matter? Some people are progressing while they're taking the ibrutinib. They're not stopping it because of intolerance, um, but they're progressing at a higher rate on ibrutinib than in XANU while on the medicine. Because that would seem to me to be an important differentiation differentiation. Of course. It's both. Wow. Yeah. It's definitely both. It's about half and half in terms of the discontinuations, and Xanu's favored in both. We did what we call a sensitivity analysis, where you exclude the patients who had evidence of progression with recent hold or stopping of the drug, and it's, Xanu is still superior to abrutinib, even with those exclusions. Wow. I mean, that's pretty amazing. So let me give you kind of an unscripted question. Do you have any thoughts about why this might be? Yeah, so I think that, well, so, you know, I do think the development of XANU was de designed to really maintain the hard pressure on that BTK, so BTK occupancy, as we call it, which means the inhibited BTK is a really high percentage. But, you know, I think that the, the most likely explanation must be that this maintained drug level throughout the whole time you're taking it matters. And you know why would that matter? Well, if the cells are able to make some new BTK, you need to have drug there to inhibit it. And that really distinguishes Xanu from a brutinib and a cala, because they don't have drug there throughout the whole time. They sort of do an early pulse, inhibit the BTK that's there, drug clears until the next dose. Xanu does the early pulse to inhibit the BTK, but then it stays around. So if you get more BTK coming along, you can still inhibit it. 
And I think that, that that theory goes with the fact that we're seeing the particularly large effect in the high-risk patients, because those are the ones whose disease is more proliferative. We might expect there to be more BTK being made. Wow, that's so interesting. Any final thoughts or conclusions you'd want the CLL patient community to know about this trial? I, you know, I think it's really exciting that we have such a dramatic effect and is safer. And, you know, what I'd like the CLL community to know is that, you know, a lot of patients who take Xanabrutinib barely know they're taking anything. Like, it's really remarkable <laughs> in terms of how they feel. So I think it's a, it's a good advance for the community. Well, this sounds like it's a potentially practice-changing uh, 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 study. I mean, this is very important research. Dr. Brown, I always uh, enjoy talking with you. I always learn things from you and your team uh, at Dana-Farber. Uh, thank you so much for all that you're doing for the CLL community. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me.